Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Gail and Chris on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes, and that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Gail Anthony Greenberg, here with Christopher Seveny. Hi, and Gail. We, hey, we are back from a very long work hiatus. We have been working like little beavers to do all kinds of things. And we had the holidays in there and all kinds of stuff going on. And it's just a great time. I'm thrilled to be back with you, Chris. And I am dying to know what just happened. Well, actually, the last two months, really, I've been enjoying the passive side of this business <laughs> and doing nothing. <laughs> I'm like me from where you are. <laughs> yeah, we could. There's not enough time. I actually think Potatize, who... They wouldn't be happy if we just went off on what's happened the last two months in one episode because they would be losing a lot of money on that. They like a story to kind of have a beginning, middle, and an end. And I don't think we have an end. It's yes. <laughs> a lot of middle. So a lot going on. I would say the biggest challenge as we entered the new year that I've had just without getting into specific details on things has been of you know, my what just happened is really starting to pay a lot more focus and attention on managing your vendors because I know I'm not the only one out there, but a lot of people recently over the last two, three months have had a hell of a time managing people and just getting responses. And I was having a conversation with somebody today and and even myself, I mean, it may take me a day or two to get back to people and sometimes, and yes, sometimes I may miss an email here and there. But when somebody constantly just doesn't even reply, and I have one right now where somebody, I spoke with them on Monday. They said, I'll get back to you on Tuesday. I'm heading out of town on Friday. I don't hear from them on Tuesday. I give them to Wednesday afternoon. I call, no answer, send an email. Then last night, I'm like, hey, before you go, what's going on? Nothing. And just a common courtesy of replying back saying, hey, I don't have an answer. I'm still working on it would go a really long way in some instances. And that just to me really sticks that knife and twists it a little bit. So that's right. kind of you know my challenge or things that I've had is just trying. And it seems like many of them have completely fallen flat on their face over the last 90 days. And granted, yeah. I'm not perfect. And I'm not, you know, and I screw up all the time. And if some, I screw up, hey, let me know if there's a better way to do things. But it comes down to sometimes just common respect to respond. I mean, I can't even get people to reply. Yeah. So the editor in me wants to organize our content here a little bit. So I'm just going to say for the benefit of our podcast producers, our topic today, if should we get around to it, is how passive is passive investing? So that's going to be our main topic. Right now, I think, yes, just to kind of summarize we are at the end of January in 2020 and the end of 2019 for me too. Like to me, it has been a period of like great upheaval. And one of the things that we really saw, that's something I think all of our note investor friends are contending with is that the servicers are like suddenly, it's like a dog that was, didn't do much, but was very placid and just slept a lot. Like they're up now and like growling and refusing to obey. <laughs> Am I right? They're like crazy. Suddenly, everyone's favorite servicer just notified everyone that they are no longer servicing loans in like a whole bunch of states, like 18 states, right? And I don't know what the count is. Yeah, you can't even, you can't board anything anymore. We have a friend who's trying to board loans in this not with this servicer, but another servicer is telling him we won't board them because the paperwork is messed up. And we've just got all these servicers suddenly being like all that about what they're expecting from us. <laughs> and it's one thing, and again, 
I think part of it is typically towards the end of the year is audit season. So some may have gotten audited. And so, but if you're going to change something within your business or how, or your expectations from people, one recommendation I give them is you kind of got to tell them. You can't just be like, oh, by the way, I, we're not doing this anymore. Or, oh, right. by the way, you got to do this now. It's like, you got to notify people of some of this stuff. And, and it goes back to kind of rewind a little bit back to communication, communicate. And people will understand, like I've got, had a servicer who said, Hey, look, this company doesn't appear to be licensed in those States and so forth. So we have to send them back to you. And I'm like, yeah. So this is a new thing. Like you get sick of your servicer, you want a new servicer. So you tell your current servicer, Hey, please send these to this new servicer. Well, your current servicer doesn't just do it anymore. They like check their credentials to see if they're licensed in all the states. And if not, they're like, oh, no, we're not sending your loans there. Like, we're not going to do them, but we're not going to send them to them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and it comes to different states have different requirements. And it's really up to the servicer that you're using. It's their liability that they got to follow the rules. You know, it's just like an attorney, you know, you hire an attorney, you're not doing checking to make sure he's every single license. I mean, you may check to make sure he's not fraudulent or something like that. But if somebody's practicing without a license, it's very difficult to know. And But from that instance, actually, I ran into that. And that's actually going to be my note and bolt. So remind me about my note and bolt today. People, if they run into that, the way to work through that. and uh, Work around? <laughs> uh, it's not a workaround, but it's basically the simple way to transfer it from one to the other if it's going to go through your entity. Uh, Okay. Because what they do is they transfer it back to you and then you transfer it to servicer. Do you have a need for legal counsel for your foreclosure, forfeiture, or eviction in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, or Illinois? Do you have an accountant bankruptcy in those states and need to discuss the matter and your options? How about an account that goes into bankruptcy in any of the 94 bankruptcy jurisdictions? The attorneys and staff at Sotili and Barilli are here to assist you with those matters and more. Head on over to our Facebook page or our website at www.sotiliambarilli.com to find out more and to reach out to our team. When legal default experience matters, choose the team at Sotili and Barilli. We're getting back to, as you can see, just based on what we're talking about, it's a very passive business that we have going on. <laughs> so, passive um, aggressive, that's what I'm thinking. So, and that's one of the things kind of I'll just roll into. And I've got two and a half months of pent up discussion. So I'm going to probably just like jump through the internet and not let Gail get a word in today. I apologize <laughs> just, in advance. That's right, uh, honey. Just vent. I know yeah. you need it. One thing that in this business, I think a lot of people will try and sell you to is the passive side of this. Right. No tenants, no toilets, no work, nothing to be done. (laughs) (laughs) Just sit there and collect those checks. And there's situations where now there's different options with that. And if you were doing private money lending, yes, I would say probably it's more passive. But most people who enter this business get into non-performing notes or CFDs, and they want the sexy non-performers, which two things. One is if you think it's going to be passive and you're going to get high returns, turn your car around and go back home from that standpoint. But I'll let you add to that because I know you have something to say. That's true. I mean, there are non-performers that hold out a lot of potential if all the planets align to give you like an unbelievable return. And that has certainly happened to you and me and pretty much everybody we know who's been doing this for more than a few months. But in general, for that to happen, there is a tremendous amount of work involved. Like, I'm not going to say it's always proportional, like the amount of work you put in equals the reward, because we have both also experienced putting a tremendous amount of work in, in order to lose money on something. <laughs> there is no straight ratio. And actually, I'm working with someone now who is a... Um, new to investing and I'm mentoring him, which has been actually a really fun experience. But, you know, I could tell through various situations that we've been through that he is just yearning for like an orderly world with very easy to understand rules about what's going to happen. What will happen if he bids a certain amount? What will happen if, you know, he just wants law, like law and order. And that is like the last thing that you've got. Like, if you want to be a node investor, like embrace 
the unexpected. <laughs> when people talk about the passive side of things and that component, it also depends on, most people think, well, it depends on how many notes are your business size. And that's really far from the truth. You know, I've got a very large portfolio under management right now. So yes, I'm going to have a lot more borrowers who have a lot more hair to their files and so forth. But I was talking to an investor yesterday and today who's got a situation that's going to be a challenge to work through on an asset. And, you know, he already told me, I was on the phone with him earlier today and he's like, oh my God, I spent way too much time on this. And he's like, the last three days, it's been like full time trying to deal with this issue. And that's just on one note. And I had that issue with one of my favorite assets in Ohio, the first, probably the first one I lost money on, where it just consumes you. And because you're dealing with all these issues and you're trying to work through them all, and it only takes one note. It just takes that one. It's kind of like having a <laughs> rental where it's no different than having a rental where they trashed a place or something and you're just trying to like get it cleaned up and stuff. And you could have 10 rentals that you never even hear from the tenants and they're good tenants. That's kind of like, having the good borrowers. And you know, if you were strictly in performing notes, I think, yeah, you'd probably be a little more passive, but I still think you're going to be running into things because this one was pretty much, I think, performing for the most part when this individual bought it. And you know, since that time, it's just completely gone upside down and sideways and in seven other directions. So with that portfolio size really doesn't have as much an effect on things because Somebody could have 20 assets and maybe one or two non-performers, and they could actually be doing less work than somebody with three assets and just has one note that's a complete disaster. I think no matter where you are, it's very difficult if you're a true note investor for it to be passive. You know, it's funny that we're talking about this because I was thinking earlier today, bulldogs were trained to actually work with bulls. Like bulldogs are very small, bulls are very large. And the way bulldogs kind of get the upper hand on bulls is they like grab onto them and their jaws like clamp shut and they like stay shut. And then the bull kind of walks around with the bulldog hanging off of it, but it, you know, somehow the bulldogs kind of get what they want out of the situation. Mm-hmm. And I thought for my whole life, I have been such a bulldog. Like I have the hardest time letting go of some things. Like I am so tenacious and the harder and crazier it gets, the harder I clamp down. And really, like my whole life before real estate and earlier in real estate, there was never like an obvious advantage in being like this. But now that I'm in notes, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I realize this is why I feel like I'm home because tenacity and persistence and the ability to just keep grinding on is, Mm -hmm. I think, maybe one of the biggest predictors of whether you'll have long-term success and satisfaction in this business. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. So just for me, um, my what just happened is that I was just told, like, I had a really bad house that I took back in really bad condition and not in a great neighborhood. So I was totally delighted when someone came along and wanted to buy it. And because I had just gone through a forfeiture on this, thing. Like I was not in a big hurry. I didn't really know the potential person very well, but the house was a mess. So my hope was like, let me give it to her in some way and hope that she fixes it up a little before she's going to crash and burn. Maybe at least the house will be in better shape when that happens. Mm -hmm. So instead of giving her a land contract and going through that whole process, I gave her a lease option. And I thought I had a really good contract. I think I actually do have a really good contract. It was actually written for me by an attorney. I tweaked a little bit. I may have, in my tweaking, actually made it maybe not valid anymore for the state where it is. I don't know. But in any case, the person has a lease option. They haven't paid for three months. I start the eviction process. And I was told today that my lease option agreement is actually a land contract pretending to be a lease option agreement. And he thinks if he tries to evict, the judge is just going to throw it out. It's going to be a big problem. So we should just foreclose instead, which is a lot more expensive, a lot longer. My first, like everyone else, when an attorney or some 
person with authority tells me something, of course, I immediately believe them. But then given five minutes, I have much quicker recovery time now. I used to believe them for a long time. Now I only believe them for like 10 minutes. And then my next thought is, well, that's one attorney. Like, let me ask another attorney. (laughs) So right now I am in the process. Like, I've got my teeth into it. Like, this guy might be right. And I might eventually have to cave to what he's saying. But I'm way away from that. Like, I am just going to keep working it. So work it and work it. It's inevitable that I have to foreclose. <laughs> <laughs> so you're taking the passive approach <laughs> and do nothing. Yes, passive aggressive. That's my new. Oh. It's for, passive aggressive real estate. It's okay. interesting you mentioned that because on the passive side of things, trying to stick with that theme, sometimes you have to take a property back and then find an agent and list it and so forth. I've got two properties, so I have more than two, but I've got at least two, actually three, but I'll talk about two. Right now, that one, the agent started it at 50000 okay? And the other one, the agent started at forty five. Both of them, they had complete interior access before listing them. You know, the agents actually went in. Agents went in, everything. The one that listed forty five, he goes, we should get a quick offer. This is easily a $40,000 house, so forth. We are down. Let's see. That was in November. So we're down into the 30s now. And then we got an offer of like 25000 where he said, I probably should take it. And I said, well, why don't you give me 40000 since that's what you said the house was worth? And he's like, because he's actually, the agent does invest a little bit. And he's like, well, yeah, but it's not worth 40. I'm like, then why did you have me list it at 45? And <laughs> I basically took it 25. I probably could have taken it, but out of spite almost, I was like, no, I almost want to wait till the listing expires and give it to somebody else. and. Similar in this other one at 50, the woman's like, yeah, I'll probably get 30 for it. And I'm like, I base my business based on what you tell me. And maybe I don't expect to get that number, but something in that vicinity. And, you know, I told that agent, I said, okay, I'm going to cut your commission by basically 50%. She was like, well, you can't do that. And I'm like, well, you've basically frauded me fraudulent and given me a number that's not even close. She goes, that's not fraud. I'm like, call it whatever you want. I said, I know it isn't, but call it whatever you want. But it's kind of back to a little bit, but some of the trials and tribulations that you run through with in this business. And again, back to people that think it's passive. Once you get an REO, I mean, you spend a lot of time just between finding an agent and trying to deal with it and making sure to check back with them. The one agent on the property that's I got another one I even mentioned that's kind of in the 30s right now. The guy went dark on me for two weeks and finally then like sends an email and he's like, oh yeah, we have one showing. And I'm like, so besides being on a servicer, attorney, collateral storage and preservation kick, which the, <laughs> I'll go to my preservation story later on, you know, it's kind of a what just happened passive investing episode. I'm getting ready to torment all of them. Yeah, it's suffice it to say, Chris is at war with everyone at the moment. So just everybody get under your rock for the moment until the <laughs> storm passes. <laughs> but I do have to tell you this story with the preservation company. And I like this preservation company, actually. They go out to a house and basically they change the locks, do everything, and they're supposed to winterize it. I have a program with them. Like any house you go out to, you change the locks, you winterize it. No mm. ifs, ands, or buts. That's what you're doing. So I was going to process of selling the property to somebody and they're like, well, yeah, you just got to deal with the frozen pipes. I'm like, there's no frozen pipes. I winterized it. He goes, that property's not winterized. He goes, your toilet bowl is completely frozen and actually cracked in half. And he sent me a picture. So I call the preservation company. I said, "Uh, why wasn't this winterized? And the person that went out there said they spoke to the lender. The lender met them out there. Okay, this is in somewhere, Missouri, so remote. I don't even know if where it is. So he said the lender was out there and told him, no, don't worry, don't bother with winterizing it. And I said, hmm, that's interesting because I said, I am in Washington, D.C. And last time I checked, nobody else has access to my account because as the 4,000 pages of documents that you made me sign, I am the only authorized user. And he's like, yeah, that's correct. And I'm like, well, guess what? I didn't make a trip out to Missouri to meet this guy to winterize his property. And I hope you can believe that. And he all of a sudden is like, yeah. And 
So basically I send them, I'm like, so what are you going to do about broken toilet and so forth? And if there's any pipes, I'm like, I'm sure you got insurance and so forth for this. And he's like, yeah, we'll have to review the contract and figure that out. And I'm like, oh, go ahead and review that contract and let me know how that turns out. Because if it's anything besides the fact that you're going to fix it, replace it, or take care of it, then we can have a few more words. So yeah, that's my preservation story, (laughs) just to add salt on the wound. You know, it's interesting, uh, just as an aside, I think all our vendors have insurance against business mistakes, mm-hmm. but man, try to get anything from them, even just an acknowledgement that they might have done something. I mean, to get know, people to admit... Really drop the ball? I mean, to get somebody to admit they make a mistake nowadays, oh my God, help us. I mean, I'll be the first to say, yeah, I effed that one up. But, and okay, let's move on how we fix it. But it's like, Clearly, in this instance, they screwed up and basically didn't winterize a property in the middle of flipping winter. And like, oh, you're not going to take care of it? It's like, are you truly serious about that? So now I've got 100 properties out there kind of running around doing things, taking pictures for me. I'll gladly switch to somebody else, take all the business away. So, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you're like the 800-pound gorilla at this point. You've got like a lot of stuff going on. Lots of buying power, lots of, (laughs) and a genuine need for vendors who really kind of embrace your problems as their own. And where are these people? They can't, they cannot be found. All make mistakes and so forth. And, but it's like, if you screw up, just like admit, like I, perfect example. I literally, before we recorded today, basically thought I had sent somebody a, a check last week. And I went in today and said, ah, oh, shoot, I didn't send it. So what I do, I sent the person a message and said, hey, look, I screwed up and your check's going out today. My apologies. And they replied back, no problem. Thank you for letting me know. That's it. People aren't going to go berserk over things. It's like, you let them know. People, we're all human. I don't know what it is. People don't like to admit that, I mean, they're, maybe they're just like afraid of getting yelled at or something. <laughs> they just don't. This is a necessary transition, everyone. You go from a small child who's afraid of getting yelled at, then you become like a big person, and you still don't like being yelled at, but you shouldn't be avoiding your issues because someone might yell at you. Like, it's going to happen. You're going to survive it. It'll be cool. <laughs> like just Everything is so much worse if you just hide and don't address things that are going on. I have to tell you something funny. This is a moment. I have a borrower calling me right now. This is the other thing. I've been getting borrowers calling today. I have everybody. Today is like freak out day. I don't know what is going on. Everyone is freaking out about something. And my phone's been ringing off the hook as well. But I don't even have as many things going on as you do. But in any case. No, I completely forgot what I was going to (laughs) say. You said you got somebody calling you and so forth. Uh, well, Mercury retrograde starting in like a week or two, I think. I forget when it starts, so that I could be a part of it. Ended. Okay, it's time for like a bit of light humor in this otherwise, this desolate landscape of complaints about everybody in the note business. So today, one of my projects is I'm about to do at my renovation down south, we're about to do a big kind of outdoor building project. We have a giant fence we have to do it like very long. It's not high, like something you would see in Game of Thrones. And we have to build a deck. So it happens that I chose like, because this is my house to keep and not to sell. I chose a really nice system that pretty expensive. Like it, it basically is aluminum poles. And then you kind of, they have channels, you just slide wood horizontally down into them. And both the wood and the poles are super expensive. And there's like tons of other stuff that's going to get built. And there's just like, it turned out to be a rather big bill. And on this particular job site, before we were working on this project, when they were doing other things inside the house, there were a fair number of building materials that were stolen. So now I figure the people who drove past and saw the material and stole it, I've got them and I've so I've got the randos who go by with trucks and steal stuff, anything that's unguarded. And I actually have a neighbor who definitely has been stealing. <laughs> so I've got all this stuff ready to be delivered. And uh, it just dawned on me, I'm going to hire somebody to camp on that lot. 
until the perimeter fence can be built and the premises secured. Mm -hmm. So I put up a Craigslist ad for someone to camp out on a lot. Mm -hmm. And it has been so hilarious because I, I have gotten a combination of people who have apparently been routinely sleeping in their cars and thinks it would be cool to earn money to do it in a particular spot, <laughs> whereas they've been doing it for free. And then I have people who are armed to the teeth and would love to be parked somewhere in a vacant lot where, God forbid, somebody walk by walking their dog. These people probably shoot at them. And I thought, this is like so crazy. For, and I asked myself, like, am I crazy to even be hiring someone to do this? Or no, this is like pretty reasonable, right? People have stolen before. They may come back. The neighbor definitely steals. <laughs> like, I think I need somebody to camp in this lot. But, oh, my God, it's a red state, so lots of guns. Some are both sleeping in their car with guns. And I thought, be very careful about tapping on anyone's window. <laughs> you see them sleeping in there. <laughs> so that's why I don't know that there was any benefit to anyone in hearing this story, but I thought you would be amused by it. <laughs> my further adventures down south uh it's here new orleans project so yeah it's actually something that just crossed my mind too that it slipped out that i was going to comment on i can't recall now oh you're People talking about done. end of month so i've got here's one for you too speaking of borrowers calling you so i had in november sent borrower paperwork to for converting a cfd to a note Okay. Sent to him on, I think it was November 2nd. Spoke to the guy three times. Every time he kept saying, I'll send it, I'll send it. I basically told him in December, I said, look, if I don't have it by like December 20th or whatever date is, I said, forget it because I'm selling the loan. I'm not owning. Basically, it's done, gone. Forget it. The guy basically never sent anything. So now the guy has called me three times in the last two days he just called again. I spoke to him yesterday once and he's asking questions. I said, there's nothing to ask. I said, I can't help you. I don't own the loan anymore. And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, what part of the last five conversations did we have in the email I sent you and the goodbye letter and hello letter? I don't own the loan. Don't you understand? He's like, well, I want to get this converted. Uh, and I'm so like, you yeah, so you weren't just playing hardball. You really had something. No, I you had... Really did have a buyer. Really. No, I had a buyer, and we were <laughs> going to hold up. Basically, mm -hmm. the buyer was like, okay, I'll give you a few weeks to try and convert it because it was in, in his best interest. But finally, it's like, you know, and, and this person was buying like 10 loans, and this one loan was holding up all 10, and I wasn't going to do a whole new agreement and everything else to cater to this one guy who can't get his shiznit together. Basically, so gave the guy one last chance and turned around and sold it. And now guys kind of like upset. And I'm like, sorry, you had the opportunity. Oh, I gave you a deadline and you didn't meet it. So you now that's ramifications. <laughs> <laughs> I think the purchaser would yeah. convert them, but it's yeah. the time I was knocking like a thousand dollars off the UPB and stuff like that, just to be, mm. to make numbers, you know, round off numbers and stuff Sweet like deal. But yeah. And now yeah. actually, Speaking of the passive side, so another borrower called me. They're 50, call it 52 payments behind. So they're a little <laughs> behind. So basically, but only one member was on the loan. So technically, the other individual, because a person may have gotten married since they had it, and I don't think they were telling their significant other what was going on, but the UPB or the loan originally was like 30 grand. And the UPB on the loan is down to like 19000 but there's $10,000 in unpaid interest. Oh, by the way, there's also right. like $20,000 in taxes because it's in you know one of those high tax states that are owed on this thing. So the payoff's like 50 something thousand. And now they're all of a sudden like, well, how'd it go from 20 to 50? And I'm like, because you haven't paid anything. I'm like, your taxes are $2,900 per year. You know, there was legal involved on this thing. Taxes haven't been paid in six years. So there's 18000 there. And, in there. Well, what happened? No, the prior, the prior servicer was paying them. So they were advancing really? them. Yeah. So the payoff is almost three times what the UPB is on this thing. And I, was, I basically told them, I said, hey, 
I'll work something out. If you make six payments in a row, mod the loan or do whatever and stuff. And all of a sudden, I think they're finally realizing like, oh, wow, it's not 20 we owe, it's like 60. (laughs) Yeah, so this is very kind of circling back to what you're saying about like, say something. There's something going on like, There is not a problem in the world that gets better from being ignored. And, you know, I don't think that borrowers really think about that. Like, Mm -hmm. particularly if they start defaulting and nothing bad Mm -hmm. happens right away, definitely builds their confidence and their feelings of well-being to the point where when you finally arrive with a real, someone who's going to now hold them accountable is going to require performance. They're kind of shocked and a little indignant, a little outraged. (laughs) Like, (laughs) who are you to tell me I need to pay this? Yeah. And I had a conversation with a borrower the other day and the service hasn't been able to get in touch with them. And I got in touch with them on the first call. So that kind of had me, you know, scratch my head a little bit. But the guy basically said, hey, look, I had this, lost my job, but I'm working again, so forth and so on. I, and he said, okay, I'll make a payment on like for today, check. But essentially I told the guy, I said, look, I'll work with you. But if you go dark again, like you did, I said, I am basically going to go dark on you. And the attorney mm-hmm. can take it from there and you'll deal with the attorney. And the only thing the attorney can do is accept the full reinstatement. So it's, if you can't make a payment, give me the courtesy to pick up the phone and call. Yeah, it's true. Oh, puppy, stop. I'm in the middle of a sad situation where I have a, contract for deed with someone that like a single mom of a child who has a disability and she's waiting they've applied for disability and I think this mom thought that disability was something you know you go down fill out a paper and they like hand you it's really probably minimally a three-year process assuming they deny you initially, which they do the vast majority of people. Then you get an attorney, then you fight, and then they two thirds of people who fight with an attorney actually get it in the end. But it takes years because you have to wait a year to get a hearing and stuff like that. So in the meantime, while all this is going on, this child who was young at the time when the mom first started defaulting, I think she's in school now. Her disability is actually quite mild. It's not a situation where she's at home and needs full-time care, nothing like that. And in an attempt to really understand the situation, I gave the borrower a financial application and I got it back. And the parts where it asks about income and everything, the mom said she had income of 150 some dollars a month. And also listed expenses of like 3500 3800 something like that. Only a tiny portion of which was her house payment. But there's like a big cable bill and there's a big car payment. And, and you're and a, like a rather large cell phone bill too. Like where's everyone who takes advantage of those $25 a month? <laughs> you know, <laughs> prepaid cell phones like... It was just such a glaring example, like looking at this financial application, such a complete lack of problem solving ability, evident in these numbers, like no effort. And just, I can't work because my daughter's disabled. And well, meanwhile, her daughter's like seven or eight (laughs) in school all day. I sent follow up questions. I was like, well, can you please tell me like what effort have you made? to find employment during the hours that you are able to work and didn't answer me. And even as kind of crazy and outrageous as that is, not even defending, you know, or explaining or anything, like I still feel bad that I'm now, unfortunately, I have sent a demand letter to them. It's just sort of like, I don't know, there's such a lack of reality-based thinking with a lot of people. It's kind of shocking. And it's really shocking for people like us who are kind of go-getters. We're problem solving in our own lives by going into real estate investing alongside having other careers. Everyone's sort of building a dream, I think, in real estate. Or they're, We kind of swim in this sea of people who are just their understanding of reality in the world is so different. 
we're always kind of scratching our heads like because you can't can't even predict like what people are going to do because you don't think the same way that they do you know you always think about what you would do in their position and that's not even a relevant consideration so so that's pretty crazy yeah our business is pretty crazy it is full of very difficult challenging things dealing with people truly different from you are think so differently and i think that that is kind of in a way the secret to why it's not passive yeah and kind of bring full circle the passive side of in which is kind of what we touched upon just based on our conversations today kind of just sharing some of our things that have occurred for the most part you know this isn't a passive business especially when you're dealing on the non-performing side again if you're dealing with performing assets things might be a little better in some <laughs> senses you know i've got a good amount of performing assets but it only takes that one to go that route and the thing people got to realize is when you're dealing with performing you're looking at you know 8 to 12% returns people who you know always want to see the sexy oh i want 20% or whatever that magic number is it comes to the point of risk and amount of work you're not going to get typically 20% for doing absolutely nothing by just buying it and collecting payments. There might be some loans that you're lucky to get like that. Example, I was bidding on some assets recently that they gave me the tape and you know basically everything was pretty much current and so forth and selling them at a pretty a nice price that provide you know, a nice return. And all of a sudden I get the collateral and so forth and going through these things and realizing, get, finally get the collateral and realizing, wait a second, these were all modded in like October, November. The seller collected like 3000 at the mod, but the people made like one payment since then and the mod basically brought them current. Prior to that, they hadn't paid in like three years. So, they, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, well, I personally don't consider those performing. Yes, they just reinstated, but, you know, they have a history of non-performing. I'm not going to pay performing or slightly less than performing for these things. I got to have that conversation with the seller tonight, actually, on that, because I sent a message on it, but uh, he said, call him. But it goes back to even performing assets. Like I said, those still can take some effort. And the interesting thing that's a little different with notes than real estate as you kind of go for full circle, because a lot of real estate investors are tired of dealing with tenants and so forth. I would think it's sometimes having a property might be more passive if you have a property manager. We can have a servicer dealing with these things, but right. at the end of the day, you still have to do a lot of work, even though there's still a servicer and probably have a lot more vendors. Whereas if you've got a decent property with a property management company, it could be, but also I know there's also those types of houses that are just problem houses as well. So Let's look at some key metrics, though. So in a rental, the property manager is probably local. Yep. Right? So those little drop-ins where you can kind of work things out with people or key, at least have them look you in the eye, they can't hide from you or run away, like that is definitely better than a, a distant servicer trying to just get somebody on the phone, you know? <laughs> So they can maybe talk them into making some payment. And then also with a property manager, their income is dependent on them getting the money from the tenant. So you're really on the same team. With a servicer, they get paid whether they're effective or not, which is never a good situation. <laughs> never motivational. So some respects. So I am a landlord, but I only own things far away from me. I don't want to deal with anything. I just want my I just want to see the rents show up in my my bank account and I'm willing to pay people. I'm fine with that. The numbers work. You know, I'm a happy camper. So the more people who are like I've got to get out of landlording so that I can do notes and be passive, I'm like bring it on baby. Where are your properties? I'll take a look at them. Now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love notes and I love investing in notes and I like notes because I can do them in the evening to look at properties and stuff. It's very difficult based on my lifestyle and things, but notes you can bid on at night and manage things at night. And it's just, it's a much, I think, easier business to scale remotely than 
rentals is for the most part. I think you can scale rentals remotely if you have really good property managers. But personally, I think notes is easier and I think you can do it with less cash from that perspective. So I think there's a big benefit there for notes, but I just try and let people know, you know, when people think it being passive and so forth, it really isn't for the most part. Yeah. So. (laughs) Yeah. So you and I have become like the wizened old people in the note business who see the newcomers come and go. And I mean, I do feel like a fair number of people get really discouraged and they kind of give up because it's really not exactly what they think it's going to be. So let's offer this podcast in that spirit. We're not trying to make anybody discouraged. On the contrary, we're trying to set realistic expectations so that you can sort of appreciate it and not feel like things are horribly wrong if it's mm-hmm. more work than you expected. Yeah, and <laughs> That's I normal, tr- gang. That's what it is. Yeah, I don't want to have it be gloom and doom. I just like to try and let people know what they're getting themselves into in that sense. And there's good days, there's bad days. And you know, there's days where you get a borrower that pays off a loan you bought for 4,000 and there's 14,000 left and they pay it off. You'll like when those happen. And there's days where basically you get a borrower handing you the deed back because they're saying, yeah, the foundation's caved in and the house is worthless. So uh, lucky. that wasn't my house, by the way, that <laughs> someone said that about. But yeah, you were talking about someone that you talked to earlier today who's got a really crazy situation going on. And he and I were discussing tactics and like, what would we do next? And because we kind of team up a little bit to work Mm -hmm. on it. And at the end, and he's like, you know, not super new. He's got Mm -hmm. experience under his belt, but not he's not run into anything like this before. And he just said to me, like, yeah, I guess this is kind of what it's like. You just never know what's going to happen. And personally, I love that part. Like, Yes. Some of the time thing you didn't think was going to happen is not a good thing. (laughs) But in general, you know, just the fact that it's so varied and interesting, and there's like, you just actually do never know what's going to happen. And I personally like that. I guess it's not for everybody, but <laughs> no. it keeps things interesting. Like, don't you wake up in the morning? You're sort of like, oh, I wonder what today will bring. I wonder that every day. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, Gail, yes. we should probably be wrapping this one up. Do you have a note and bolt you'd like yes. to Yes. My note and bolt is, it's a quote from my husband. My husband always said, never say what else can happen. He said, because you will be answered. <laughs> 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 the quote so my son sometimes like oh we'll try that so he's been watching a lot of star wars right recently and every time he hears the word try he's like daddy there is no try it's either do or not do or yoda has a quote like that and he quotes yoda right. all the time so i've got a eight-year-old <laughs> running around the house quoting yoda and i'm like yeah that's actually true for people out there I mean, if you're running into sometimes the servicing component, because I know somebody asked it on Notes and Bolts group as well. Typically, the servicer will send out the goodbye letter. And if it's transferred to you, they'll put your name on it. What I found out 10 minutes before we recorded this episode is instead of you sending out a hello letter, you can send out an election of servicer letter, which basically noted that it's getting transferred to you, but you've elected to use a servicer. It's probably the same thing as if you just started a new loan that you're not going to collect the money, you're going to use the servicer. So basically, it's an electric servicer that says, hey, look, basically, we've elected to use this servicer and here's our contact information. And then you send that to the borrower, you send it to the servicer, and then when they board it, they will send the hello letter. So the servicer still has to send a hello letter, even though you sent that. So. Yep. Yeah. So you're not sending the hello letter. You're actually just sending a letter mm-hmm. telling them you have elected to use a servicer. So, and it's a very, and I've figured out how to, after many years of Word, how to use uh, Excel with Word and the mail merge. So I've got my VA putting it in a spreadsheet, then basically all the information and probably take him about two hours. Then he'll email it back to me and then I'll just click the button and then have all the letters hit print, bring them to the post office. And there we go. Cool. So I have two final observations. First of all, there's a guy in New Orleans named Pimento who is willing to camp out on my vacant lot. So that was great. Pimento, no doubt. 
And then I just think it's really cool that your eight-year-old son has elected to receive his life wisdom from Yoda instead of you, Chris. I think all in all, we can agree that's a reasonable choice. So oh. sorry, bud, but <laughs> I'm sure you'll be able to show him how to fish. So. Yoda can't. That, I don't think so that and I've been teaching him basketball recently and he has quick family story here he has but like, never played basketball so he started oh my he's, God. we signed him up and stuff so he's like literally never dribbled a basketball in that sense so he's going and of course he's playing with kids who had already played last year and at that age they pick it up very quickly and stuff so he's trying to dribble and he's kicking and it's gone all over the place and you know, every night I spend a half hour with him working on dribbling and we've got a hoop now outside, which I'm glad he did because I want to put a hoop outside and it's easier to blame it on the kid than tell the wife you want the basketball hoop because <laughs> you you know, you're 44 years old, you're going to get hurt and end up in the hospital thing. So, um, but the eight year old needs it. <laughs> so I finally figured out a way to get through to him was it's like in soccer, they just run around closest to the ball. So I basically, right. I finally convinced them like, okay, you're a shark and you go, if anyone <laughs> basketball, basically the block down near the basket, the two blocks on each side. I'm like, go back and forth on each block, depending if the ball's on that side, you're a shark. You're just waiting for the ball. Like you're waiting for that fish. Okay. And just go back and forth and somebody will eventually pass it to you. And then you turn and shoot. Okay. So in his second game, I basically, he's out there. I'm like, Richard, I, I, I go, be the shark. So he runs and um, one of his <laughs> friends, one of the kids that was inbounding the ball and he was literally like the only kid close to the basket. So he throws it to him. And first thing the thought is, oh, I hope he catches it. But he caught it, turned around, shot it and went in. And it was just a proud parent moment. And he had this big smile on his face and all the kids on the team were happy for him and stuff. And um, uh. <laughs> so, but, um Yay! That is awesome. So that and uh, well, on that high note, <laughs> shall we say farewell? Yes, we should say farewell and a few things, which this will probably get posted, published afterwards. But we are kicking back off our Thursday evening sessions again. So continue to start joining us, and we've got some great speakers lined up coming up on Thursday evenings as well. And yeah, so how do they sign up for that? Because the old links, do the old links still work for that? No, I got to I got a new one. I got to yeah, sign out a new one. On yep. the Facebook group to receive the, to see mm -hmm. the link to the... Uh, yep, so I'll update it there. I'll update it on the webpage. I'll send it out to the individuals in, who have subscribed in my email service as well. So we'll be getting that out to everybody. One thing I'll mention too is I was asked to provide a presentation for Cash Flow Expo, which is coming up. I think it's the 6th through the 8th. It's a free online 25 speakers that it's free if you're live and I think you can buy the recordings afterwards or whatnot. But I've basically my link allows people to see who signed up. And I was actually surprised because we've got like 800 people in our group and only about 40 people signed up. Right. You know? Now, the other thing though is that a lot of people sent out links to it so people might yeah. already have signed up with somebody they, else. They have, and I'm just curious, and again, I'm not benefiting from anything on that, I don't think, anyways, um, from people who are looking for some information, listening to people, and again, I don't know a few of the speakers on there, so I'm going to listen to them just to try and um, see and learn from them as well. But uh, I signed up. So. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, like, don't ever think you're too advanced to learn something. I mean, every time I go to an education event, I see a lot of people that I think of as way more advanced than I am. And they all just, everybody knows, you never know where you're going to pick something up. So yeah, be open, so. keep your head open. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of the Good Deeds Don't Investing podcast. It's good to be back. And refreshed and a little bit fired up. Gail, any final thoughts? No, uh, tune in for more rants. We've just gotten started. We've got a lot of pent up <laughs> things to say. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good one.
Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast with Chris Seveny and Gail Anthony Greenberg. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.